Okay, let's go. Freeform micro optics have the capabilities to revolutionize industries. Imagine automotive lighting that is perfectly aligned with the design of the car, or lighting solutions that provide better energy efficiency, better light distribution, and perfect aesthetics. Imagine all AR and VR capabilities with better resolution, feeling more realistic, yet the device reduced to a size that you don't even realize you are wearing. Or improving your home with luxury and smart windows. That is the power of freeform micro-optics. The ability to create optical shapes in any form you want, completely miniaturized for perfect integration. Opening up new opportunities for security and branding, optical communications, consumer electronics and more. And now imagine that this can be done with equal or even better specifications than conventional systems and at lower costs. This is why Fabulous has opened up the one-stop shop in freeform micro-optics, making this technology now easily accessible to everyone who wants to implement it, proving a full supply chain of world-class freeform micro-optics specialists. We can take you from design to prototyping and into pilot production for full product life cycle, including design, modeling, origination, tooling, and manufacturing services. Some have already paved the way by integrating freeform micro-optics into their product portfolio. Are you ready to take the next step in your product development? Make it fabulous! And contact the one-stop shop for freeform micro-optics at info at fabulous.eu. We are fabulous! Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Jeremy Pico Clement, Technology Manager at Epic. I'm pleased to moderate this uh, fabulous workshop of today on uh, freeform micro optics for consumer electronics applications. So, we'll uh, talk and learn about freeform micro optics technologies today uh, through eight uh, highly relevant speakers. And uh, yeah, the aim of this workshop is uh, for you as participants to get the maximum information uh, of Fabulous and of course get uh, answers as well. That's why I warmly invite you to uh, ask any question we have after its presentation and also uh, at the end of this uh, workshop. Um, so as I just said, uh, the today's online workshop will be focused on consumer electronics application and we will have uh, eight um, speakers. So it's important to get inputs from them uh, on this topic. So why we wanted to have a focus on consumer electronics application and market. So few insights here. Uh, so we can observe a uh, growing demand for high quality displays and cameras. Uh, we have a need uh, for miniaturization of devices, compact and efficient system needs uh, will grow in the near future as well. So we can also observe a rising uh, focus on energy efficiency. And uh, I think that you didn't pass for the news uh, from Apple two weeks ago about their new Apple Vision Pro product, which may open new doors for photonics technology. Um, something also interesting is that uh, this market is aimed to go at the CG of 7% from 2020 to 2027, which make it uh, really attractive in terms of uh, business opportunities. Why uh, freeform micro optics for consumer electronics? So as uh, just said, miniaturization and efficiency are two drivers for the technologies which aim to, to bring all these technologies to another level. Um, and these freeform micro-optics FFMO can also bring high precision and performance despite their small size and all new kind of innovative design, which makes them really interesting for, for, for this industry. Um, here you can see the agenda for the today's OTM, uh, today's workshop, sorry. So we have the first presentation by Mariana Balota uh, from Morphotonics, um, then uh, Samuli Sitonen from Nanocomp, Raphael Porcar from Imagine Optic, Myun Sik Kim from uh, Accetris, Harald Gissen from the University of Stuttgart, then Andreas Volker from uh, CSEM, and we will end this uh, workshop with Sanjay. Gangadara from uh, ANSYS. A um, few uh, words also about Fabulous. So um, I would like to, to shortly introduce uh, this pilot line. So Fabulous is a European funded project pilot line uh, within the Horizon H 2020 program for the manufacturing of freeform micro optics. Uh, the aim of uh, the Fabulous pilot line is to unify European research and technology organization and also 
industrial partners into a pilot line for the design and manufacturing of freeform micro optic solutions. And as I just said, the pilot line is focused on FFMO from design to manufacturing. We observe that also this, uh, these technologies gain an uh, increasing industrial interest in the last few years. And uh, here we can, you can see some of uh, the field of application where FFMO can be used and bring uh, a value. So um, yeah, we have security and branding, lighting, automotive, air, of course, uh, image on displays uh, among other applications. And on the top, uh, you have the use cases of this pilot line, which aim to demonstrate the real positive impact of such technologies in their system. So from consumer electronics to uh, automotive lighting as well. Um, here is a use case, use case related to consumer electronics market um, with the augmented reality glasses from micro OLED. So the active look glasses, uh, which use actually a micro display for uh, the uh, it's uh, air solution in sport market, and they actually included uh, free from micro optic in their optical system. So, uh, what is the for Fabulous? Um, so, Fabulous offers an, an easy access to a full value chain from the design to the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing services from prototyping to piloting a, a large, so a large volume production. And now, maybe the main information here. Um, with a funding up to 90% through the open call, depending mainly, of course, on the side and income of the company. So please um, go on the website if you're interested or come to me also if you need any more information. Another important information about the open call, um, so it will close at the end of 2023. So you have now, uh, yeah, you have six months to go from, uh, from now. Um, but we have open call every month and the process is also faster than before. So I really, and I warmly invite you um, to, to, to ask your question uh, to us if you, have, uh, if you are interested uh, in Fabulous. Uh, two important contacts. Uh, so you can come to me, of course, but you have also Jessica Van Eyck, Managing Director of Fabulous, and Ton Offerman's Technical Coordinator. If you have questions, I will invite you to contact Jessica for all things related to the applicant process and turn if it's related to the technical side. But uh, yeah, as just said, uh, I can, of course, as part of the project, provide you information. So feel free also to contact me um, if needed. So let's go back now to the workshop, uh, to this workshop. So I will now invite um, Mariana from the uh, so development engineer at Morphotonics to, to start the presentation and to start uh, the workshop. So please, Mariana, you can share your screen and um, yeah, the floor is yours. Okay. Can you see it properly? Yes, you can start. Okay, good. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Jeremy said, my name is Mariana Bolotin and I'm a development engineer at Morphotonics. So today I would like to tell you a bit about large area nano imprinting for freeform micro optics applications with the focus of the consumer electronics market. So when you think about the consumer electronics market, displays are in the very core of it. And we can see this not only by the growing patent, uh, number of patent applications in the past decades, but also um, by our everyday life. We use displays for everything we do. Um, and uh, displays are a very visual application and our eyes are a very sensitive tool. So how can we actually improve um, this, uh, this experience or improve this performance? And the answer lies in uh, optical elements. So uh, if you would apply, for example, uh, a texture on a display, uh, this could make this display more readable outside without you increasing the brightness of the display. So increasing your experience and also reducing the battery consumption. Uh, but you also could think about new uh, opportunities or new experiences uh, as having uh, augmented reality glasses uh, when you're using, for example, uh, slanted gratings. Uh, and also uh, increasing uh, experiences like having glasses, uh, free 3D uh, experiences when you're using lenticular, um, lenticulars. Um, but then the question is, how can we actually make these optical elements? How can we produce them? Um, and the answer is, uh, one answer is uh, nano imprinting. 
So with nano imprinting, you can use uh, a you have a design freedom for micro and nano textures, um, and that's where Morphotonics comes in. So Morphotonics is a key enabler in large area nano imprinting technology. Uh, what uh, can help uh, with uh, producing high volume products. So I'd like to tell a bit about Morphotonics in this sense. So uh, Morphotonics is a company that has sells uh, rotor plate and nano imprinting machines. Um, it was founded in 2014 when we saw the need for a uh, large area nano imprinting. Um, currently we have uh, 40 employees and we have our own clean room. In this clean room, uh, we develop process together with our customers and for our customers. And this process can be the actual imprint process or can be a resin, resin development. It could also be a, a multi, um, upscaling uh, of uh, some master, flexible stamp production, uh, and also flexible stamp uh, development. Uh, we have uh, numerous patents uh, and we sold more than uh, 20 tools worldwide. So uh, our role to play technology is proven in production. And currently we have in the market also um, uh, products that are using uh, nano imprinting um, from, our, from our machines. So basically uh, we can upscale and we also have our proprietary consumables, uh, UV curved resins and flexible stamps. But how does this actually work? So that's what I would like to tell you a bit about. So as I said, we sell rotor plates and then printing uh, technology. And basically we have rollers and around these rollers, we have a flexible stamp. This flexible stamp contains the texture. So it could be micro or nano texture. And we use a curable resin. This curable resin is in, in, the, in the actual um, substrate and it's pressed against the stamp and, uh, and the roller. And then this texture is filled with resin. Then after it's cured and delaminated. And when it's delaminated, you have your product. So this can be done for very precise uh, structures going from 500 micrometers to 50 nanometers. So very large to very small. And it could be done for Fresnel lenses or slanted grating. So the design freedom is there. Um, we also can do this very small textures in a very large area. So more than one square meter. And it really doesn't matter the, the type of application like OLED, LCD, in the sense that uh, it's a road to plate. So it's very versatile. Uh, also, uh, we can do uh, imprint cycles that are less than two minutes long and we can enable mass production. But what's the beauty of it is that we have a flexible stamp that can be used multiple times. So we do one product and then you can, you can do over and over and over again. And you can use this flexible stamp for more than a thousand times. So this is very cost effective. So you can have multiple textures in, in, a, in a square meter and use this stamp many times. But of course, we are not an island. We are in the part of an ecosystem. And to actually do our own work, uh, uh, we need first to have a design of the texture, then the mastering of the texture. And with this master, we can produce our stamps and actually uh, produce imprints. Um, so I will give you an example of work done recently uh, with Morphotonics, but with, together with other companies too. So we had a consortium of companies working in an augmented reality uh, topic. So light drones enable the design of a, a waveguide. And this waveguide was produced into a master by NILT and uh, shot provided the high refractive index glass. So with the single eyepiece master provided by NILT, Morphotonics with our proprietary technology uh, multiplied this one piece into 270 pieces in a stamp. And this stamp could be used in to providing one cycle, 270 pieces of waveguide. This can be done in a one piece, very large piece of Gen 5 glass, for example, in one cycle, 270. Or you could also think about, for example, many pieces of glass. Here, for example, we have nine pieces of high refractive index glass provided by SHOT. Um, after this one cycle, you have 270 waveguides and you can singulate them, put into a product. So we also had a collaboration with a metrology company, the Fidelity. And the Fidelity actually checked those waveguides and we can see that we have reproducibility. We can consistently uh, 
replicate these textures. So one imprint is the same as the next imprint and the next imprint and the next imprint. So another example of textures uh, that can be used in the consumer market uh, is anti-glare texture that I just said before. And um, here I'm giving an example of an anti-glare demonstrator that we, we made at Morphotonics with publicly accessible textures. Um, and the textures are on the right side. And you can see these different textures and all of them can be actually replicated by this technology. Um, so you can actually think about uh, real design freedom and which, which, which side, kind of texture would you like to replicate. Uh, also, these textures for anti-glare, for example, they are on top of a glass, so you imprint it. You can use it as imprinted directly, but you could also etch it out and make it much more resistant to scratch, for example. Um, an extra application is in the glass-free 3D display. So, as I said, design freedom. So we can actually nano-imprint directional backlight grating. Uh, we can uh, lenticular lens arrays, micro lens arrays. And this is, for example, a product that's in the market right now. Um, so in general, you would think, OK, you are showing me a lot of display applications, but we are also in a, in a, in a we also want to know more, right? Uh, so applications go beyond display. It's not just display. But you could have, for example, uh, increased light collection efficiency in solar vehicles. You can have lenses on solar panels, micro lenses, micro lens arrays, for example. Or you could have actually uh, pillars uh, that enable uh, smart windows, also imprinted. The anti-reflective coating doesn't necessarily need to be just for displays, but you can apply in different substrates. The substrates uh, can be uh, glass, or it can be also a polymer plate. And you can also do, for example, uh, textures that are more easy to clean or that don't get as dirty or are hydrophobic. But also, uh, you can just be pretty, right? We, we are people, we like th pretty things. And here you have a very beautiful example of a diamond-like texture from Zwarovski that was produced during the fabulous use, use case of Zwarovski. So um, it can be all of this. So uh, we are Morphotonics. We like to morph dreams into reality. We are a very diverse company uh, and we like to collaborate with innovative companies uh, to build different visual experiences. So if you think that it is interesting and uh, our, our technology, please talk to us. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I'm glad to answer. If uh, you have extra questions later on, please uh, send a message to us at info at, dot, info at morphotonics.com. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mariana, for uh, this interesting uh, presentation uh, of the capabilities of Morphotonics. It's really, really interesting. Do you have any, any questions, please, from the, from the attendees? You can raise your hands through, through Zoom uh, at the bottom. You have a, you have a button. Maybe, maybe I would like to start with uh, one short question, Mariana. So, um, so you are a part of the of the fabulous uh, pilot line. Um, can can you tell us maybe a little bit more uh, um, about your role uh, in this fabulous pilot line and what you did actually already? We well, understood <laughs> that you were involved in this use case for 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 the different use cases, but can you just tell tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah. So I was mainly involved in two use cases. One was Seisenbacher for lighting. Uh, and we were replicating Fresnel lenses. So actually we had a collaboration with uh, Yoneon Research. Yoneon Research was doing the step and repeat for the, for, from the master. So in this sense, then in this, in this case, we didn't, uh, we didn't upscale, but Yoneon Research did. Uh, CSCM was a very good collaborator doing the galvanization. So uh, I had many communications with different companies, what is very enriching. Um, and uh, I myself, uh, together with Lovelin, my, my colleague, we replicated uh, the textures here. So we produced the flexible stems and replicated the textures that were after sent to VTT for, for tooling. So we had uh, contact with the whole chain, what was very interesting. My role was in the replication and producer, producing of the flexible stem. Um, but it was uh, it's interesting to see the whole process, how it goes and mm -hmm. reaching uh, the final uh, the final company that in this case was Saiz and Bacher. So yeah, that, that was my participation. Thank you, Mariana. Any question for, for Mariana? 
Okay. So thank you again, Mayana. Thank you very thank much you. for your presentation. Thanks a lot. And now um, I would like to, to give the floor to, to Samuli Sitonen from, uh, from Nanocomp. So Samuli, you can uh, share your presentation and start. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. And thank you for your everyone to join to that webinar. And it's nice to be here and it's explain something about our technology and uh, our application where we are working related to uh, micro optics based solutions and that. Uh, so my name is Samuel Sidon and I'm CTO of, of uh, Nanocomp company and uh, Nanocomp is a company which uh, which, sorry, which provide to to light guide based optical component mostly. So light guide manufacturing company is uh, is uh, is Nanocomp and uh, and uh, but we have also some uh, application segments where we're living and we call that the light manage management films. And these films means that the, basically all of our components are based on polymer films. Uh, Mariana explained it nice about those more photonics technology and uh, we are we are closely working in the same business area but based on quite different type of technology but actually those applications are quite close the same and and depending what are the requirements from from custom side and those applications side so like I say that we are we are we are producing our product based on roll to roll for polymer film and uh, and uh, that has been quite many years in our mind technology. We have some experience in our history, also other type of technologies like paper scale replication, nano imprint, and also injection molding. So we have a really long history in manufacturing area of of micro and nano structures. And um, and like I maybe I didn't mention that we located in Finland, but we operated globally. So most of our customers located in Asian area because we are component suppliers, those integrators are our direct custom level. But of course, those brands who own those final device located also around the world quite many times in US area. And that is the reason why our operation happens all the time in, in the global level. Uh, and we have those uh, some other 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 access also those uh, like in Japan and Taiwan where location are mostly our sales sales people and uh, some engineering supporting people to our custom custom related. When we talk about this kind of uh, uh, light guide based on microstructures, it can be provide quite. Uh, different type of uh, functionality to that kind of illumination and target. And, uh, and uh, of course, this kind of display illumination has been quite a long time our mind, mind, mind most important area where we are working. And, uh, and uh, this, there's the simple image about that kind of reflective type of displays in mobile phone. And uh, that is our mind area where we are working. So we are providing those uh, those light guides for reflective type of displays, also some other type of display model, but mostly in the reflective types. So later, I will explain in more detail what it means and what are those microstructures based on solutions in this type of applications. When we talk about our core competence, we can roughly share those in, the, in three different categories. Of course, optical design is all the time really important part of that kind of micro optical based or, or nanostructures based on an optical components. And uh, we have own capability to do those needed micro and nanostructures. And uh, we are profiling like this kind of really flexible cooperators and a company who can provide to different type of prototype for our customers. And this is something what is really, really important part of our business that we can we can realize our customer custom customers customer ideas, we can design it, those uh, the functionality based on op microstructures or nanostructures. And, uh, and we have also own integration capability. So basically we can, we can laminate it and glue all of those needed components together so we can see the final functionality quite nicely during this prototyping phase. At the same time, we are also this kind of high volume product production cap company using this roll to roll method. And, uh, and basically we can provide the whole supply 
process chain starting from design to ending this uh, volume product and delivering those to the integrators. And later I will explain those mine business area and those technical solutions. So we have quite different type of application area where we are working, but mostly in the, those light guides and those management rooms. Okay, our capacity at the moment, we have own, own origination capacity of, uh, of micro and nanostructures, and we have own tuning capacity related that electroforming of those nickel plates, what we normally use. And that is the, one of the biggest difference in our technology and more photonics technology, like Marianne explained it, that uh, uh, more from the technology is based on kind of soft modes when it's possible to uh, manufacture those components, also that kind of non-transparent type of uh, substrate. But in our case, we normally use nickel electroformic tooling plates, which means that we have to be some level transparent substrate material to the UV light, because our replication method is absolute same type of what is in the more photonics. So we use the UV grubble resins to create those microstructures. And, uh, and then the UV light is this most critical wavelength what we use this, uh, this uh, replication process. We have basically two methods available, so-called C to C type of level replications, what we can use mostly in the research and development level and the final high volume production level, we have two line, two roll to roll line, the replication of those uh, final components in the film form. Of course, cutting is something which is really important part of that kind of process chain because in the, our product, our production is based on roll to roll. So after roll to roll pro process, this component is in roll form and a typically integrator of one to see this, that final component in, in right shape. So we have laser cutting and die cutting capability, and we have several lines what can what we, what we can use for quite high volume uh, cutting cutting um, capacity. Uh, roll to roll process is is really when we simplify it, it looks really simple. So basically, we have some films. We put in the UV resin on the top of the film, and after then we activate it those. And we're pushing those uh, replicated mold together around this uh, cylinder, embossing cylinder, and then we activated those by UV light when it changed the form from liquid to solid. And uh, and uh, it's it's it looks really simple, but of course it's quite complex depending structures type and needed resins and uh, and uh, what is this hardness value of resins and uh, itself. This resin is really important part of that red that replication process, like Mariana explained it, that they have also several, even several hundred different type of recipes, what they use depending application requirements. And we have same situation. And actually that is the main reason why we manufacture it or mixing those own resin for every project. We have to customize basically all the time the UV resin recipe, depending what are those requirements from our custom application level. So we have own in-house development capability to fine tune those UV resin just based on those requirements of optical parameters or mechanical parameters. Standard material, what we use is polycarbonate, PMMA, PET, and sometimes also TPU, if you need it really elastic type of film material. And thickness variation is roughly 10 micron to 500 micrometers, which we can handle by roll form. And that is also the biggest difference because if you think about roll to plate method, what is available more photonics, they can handle really thick type of substrate, which is not possible by, by roll to roll method. And, uh, and, uh, and then it's really important to think about when we start a new project that uh, what is needed as uh, component thickness and what is then needed the uh, manufacturing method. And this is the really important part of Fabulous project because we can offer the really different type of uh, manufacturing method under this ecosystem depending those custom needs. The thought video of what it looks in the, in the real level when we talk about roll to roll process, this is our production lines which look like in printing line what you have maybe seen in the magazine printing but we printing the we printing those microstructures and there are several units starting from coding casting mass vision, laser marking uh 
a park opening to cleaning and all of those are integrated in same same line and inside the clean room we can running those so, so we can provide really clean components and uh, and uh, also production rate is really really high uh like i mentioned that nanocon can offer this kind of whole process chain starting from design to productions and this is something which is really unique from from around the world because uh, we are really one stop company that if you need that kind of special type of microstructure space, light cut for front light cut, we can do all of those in house. So we, we, we can design those structures, we can manufacture those origination microstructures, we can tooling, we can, we can fine tune those UV racing, we can, we can product those in uh, final product in high volume and cutting that in, in final phase. And all of those are available from from same 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 uh, uh, organization from Nanocon. Uh, when we're looking itself, these microstructures in the structures level, of course, the left side we have really standard type of microlens matrix, which is used nowadays quite many applications. And uh, when we talk about free form, make maybe biggest issue is that we can quite nicely to modify those different type of 3D shape of microstructures. In the left side, you will see some kind of micro lens, lens matrix again, but then we have slightly modified those, those uh, shape of those micro lens. It's not anymore so pure as far, it's, some, it's some way, some way um, uh, that kind of modified. And we have a lot of flexibility to find doing those shapes. And, uh, and the next image so quite nicely what we use a lot of in our light guide applications, we, we can manufacture it, example, different type of micro prisms, which is a lot of use in, in our light guide applications. And basically all kinds of uh, microstructures are some level possible based on this kind of reform micro optical based on the origination and replication method. Of course, there's some limitation depending those uh, angle and uh, and uh, depth of those structures depending what we are looking. But the uh, flexibility is nowadays really really large. When we talk about example fabulous ecosystem, we have several different type of origination company and organization who can do different type of microstructures, different depth, different size. And uh, and uh, that is the one of the really really positive things when we think about the benefit of that fabulous organization. But in our company, we are mostly focused for this kind of microstructures, which are some way related to light guide or light managing. Then we have some thickness range, what we most mostly would like to do. Uh, but uh, but those other partners can be handle other type of structures. So. So if you really are interested, you can you can you have a lot of flexibility to find out the just right type of structures for your applications. Okay, then I have some slides about our our product and solutions what we offer to our customers. Like I mentioned, that light guide segment is one of the biggest part of our volume products, and there is special those front light guide for reflective type of displays. And there, the mind segment has been quite many times this kind of e-reader type of display illumination components, for example, e-ink type of uh, uh, electrophoretic type of display. Now there's more and more interest coming from that uh, re reflective type of LCD uh, illumination solutions. And uh, that is something what we are development a uh, few years and uh, those first products that are coming out from from uh, our customers and uh, also we have some some special type of backlighting functions but backlighting is quite well known business area and uh, we can just offer to some really special type of ways this price level is so high that it tends to do based on that our quite complex manufacturing method but if you talk about this kind of standard type of backlight which is using mostly in the lcd there's maybe some more cost effective way to do that and its competition is quite hard that can stand the type of backlight illuminations. Light management built, like I mentioned, those microlens arrays, it's something which is quite much, and those interest is more and more growing up. Uh, mini LED diffuser is something also where we are working different type of microlens structures, film like in 
and final lenses and uh, and uh, some multi-layer reflection in external films and there's still some uh, our history some uh, uh, reference for example microfluidistics which is totally different area but based on this type of production method can be provided also that and they mention also wave cut we have some history in that but uh, but that's really special type of wave cut not that level what is explained by mariana that it's really imaging type of wave guides. We are more talking about this kind of signal type of wave guides because we are talking about polymer type of substrate and those requirements are not so high level what is in the in the glass plate based on uh, wave guides. There's some just idea what we only talk about this kind of illumination uh, solution for front light guide. We talk about really ultra thin type of flexible light guide. We talk about range 0.2.5 millimeter thick light guides. And uh, at the moment, we can handle those microstructures origination up to 15.6 inch diagonal size. And uh, in this type of solution can be provide with excellent optical performance. Uh, and, uh, and just reason why it's using special in the front light that way is needed. Really high transparent type of functionality based on this microstructure. Uh, when we talk about this uh, front light guide nowadays, we can categorize those two type of mind display area where we are working so-called e-paper type of displays and nowadays colors are more and more coming also at that level and this reflective type of LCD which is also coming quite much in more and more uh, interest. And uh, what, is, what is critical point of this kind of front light we talk about this integration is fully optical bonding, which is a big difference between the standard type of LCD where light guide and backlight guides is, is not fully bonded, it's just with those air cap. And in our solution, because front light guides integrated in the front of this display, there have to be some kind of glue that we can see that it's whole stack in, in this kind of con, uh, solid form without any air caps. And there you will see that kind of cross section of typical uh, uh, e-reader type of displays and you you understand why this kind of uh, micro optical based or freeform micro optical based uh, uh, light card have to be really high quality type of light card because it is the front of this display and any kind of errors or defect can be really visible because it is just between those display and human eye. And this is the biggest difference if you think about that kind of standard type of backlight, because backlight solution, the light got located under the display when it's hiding quite some errors and it's not so sensitive for any kind of defect, what might be happens in the example manufacturing process or it might become from material. So when we talk about quality requirements of front light cut, it is really, really high level because just only a few micrometers errors can be really visible when we light in carbon light inside. It's 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 like a stars in in the sky in the in the night time. So even that human eye cannot be realized this kind of few micron defect, but when we when we illuminate it those in light guide mode, it will come to visible. And that is the something which is really important to understand that uh, based on that type of solution microstructures and uh, light guide and uh, really high quality material we can find out just the right type of quality for that type of uh, uh, application and in general it is a benefit when we talk about of this kind of front light guide of course contrast can be really high when we talk about really complex microstructures we can handle quite nicely those color camouflage and, uh, and, uh, and we can also fine tune those color comet using special type of material. Uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can control that kind of fast white balance adjustment using different type of uh, recipe of UV resin. And we can also control those op other optical defects like in LED Mura and, uh, and some, some other, some other uh, optical defects which coming from this LED lighting par. And all of those can be handled that we have really flexible way to modulate with those microstructures. We have a lot of free, 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 free from uh, possibilities to fine tune those size of microstructures, angle, rotation, position, intensity, 
And this is only way to do that kind of using that kind of really complex microstructure space uh, 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 solution. And there's some reference where you can find out our components. There's a different type of uh, handheld device with, which are based on electrophoretic type of displays, mobile phones, uh, this kind of uh, notebooks and, uh, and some other type of uh, devices. And also this kind of digital signage is an area where, we, where you can find out our light guides like in this kind of time, time cell in bus stops. And uh, there's this kind of front light guard on the front of that uh, uh, displays. We have also some really interesting area where we are working in our history and all the time. We have some project, example, this kind of visible privacy winter filter films to the mobile, uh, I'm sorry, for this uh, automotive industry application. So basically car displays. And for that type of uh, displays, we can provide some special type of films which can be can be used just in privacy privacy mode. We have also some customers which use this kind of light guide film in decoration level, like in core door panels, uh, and that 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 is really area based on business because we, they can easily to illuminate it quite large area using really thin light guide, and it can be really flexible, and they can. They can modify those 3D shapes of that light card depending what is the shape of this door door panel. And also, we are providing some uh, uh, management film for fingerprint sensor applications, and uh, and this is the reason why we are providing this type of lens uh, matrix type of film because in this type of fingerprint sensor, the thickness of uh, micro lens array have to be really really thin. We talk about just only some 10 micron thick films and uh, and then basically roll the roll process is a really nice process to provide that type of extreme thin uh, film with those microstructures. Okay, and the final presentation is that uh, what, what Jeremy just explained it, that we are part of that fabulous ecosystem. So anytime if you have idea, you can take to contact our front office or Jeremy or me or Mariana, and uh, we can discuss on your idea. And uh, our target is find out some application from your, based on some idea what you have might be in your organization or your company. And we want to help you to find out to that kind of real, functionality based on three, four micro optics. Thank you for your interest. And, uh, and this was really nice to explain to our story and our technology. Thank you very much, uh, Samuli, for, for your presentation. It's, uh, it's also good to see the, that we have producers on the market. So really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, any question, please, for, for Samuli. You can raise your hand through Zoom. Yeah, maybe a short one from, from my side again, uh, same that I asked for to Mariana. Um, uh, maybe about your experience working, uh, you know, in, in the fabulous uh, ecosystem. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about your experience um, working uh, for the pilot line? Yeah, of course. This is really nice ecosystem because I would like to say that this is something what is not available any any other place in the world. When we think about how many different type of technologies are available, only one contact point. We have at least six different origination methods. We have three different replication method. We have a lot of understanding about those uh, manufacturing capability in the small and medium volumes and high volumes. And we have really strong this kind of research and uh, research institution on our background, which can put support to our in the designing level and uh, really unique know-how level. And uh, and uh, I'm really, really happy about to join this kind of ecosystem. And uh, my feeling is that uh, some of people, they don't really understand how much information we have possible to offer to, to our customers and those applications. and. Uh, and uh, and it's it's something really unique unique ecosystem at the moment what we have in mind. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's good also to organize this kind of uh, of workshop. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Samuli. If we have no more questions, thanks a lot, Samuli. Again, um, thank you. So let's.
start with uh, our next speaker, so Rafael Porca, uh, scientific coordinator at Imagine Optic. So Rafael, um, you can start the floor, is yours. Yeah, so I will try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, it's good. Can, can, can. Okay, let me move this window maybe. Okay, so thank you all for joining this, uh, this workshop. My name is uh, Rafael Porca. I'm scientific coordinator at Imagine Optic. And today I will review a few um, implementation uh, of metrology for mass produced micro optics we, we made for our, our customers. So a few words about Imagine Optic. Our company is, is founded since, since uh, 1996. We have deployed more than 2,000 uh, sensors worldwide. And uh, innovation is part of uh, our DNA. Um, so we, we always uh, keep pushing the boundaries of uh, uh, optical metrology by reference sensing for, for our customers uh, in, in manufacturing in, in particular. So as a reminder, um, uh, what wavefront sensing and uh, Shaq Hartman wavefront sensing in particular is, is providing, first of all, it's a way to control the optical quality of your um, optics and, and micro optics in, in this case. So it gives you access to the transmitted uh, wavefront, um, to the surface shape and the surface flatness. And then you can also calculate more complex parameters um, such as MTF, the distortion. You can calculate the focal length of your uh, components and, and systems. And uh, also uh, you can access not only to the quality of individual components, but also um, to you can use it to adjust uh, the relative positioning of optical component within a complex system. Uh, in such a way, you optimize the performance of this uh, system. Okay, so um, what what makes uh, Shagarman wavefront sensing quite uh, unique uh, as a metrology solution is that it's really um, easy to, to use and uh, implement as you can uh, uh, measure any kind of uh, beam shape of, uh, uh, let's say, convergent, divergent, collimated beam of any numerical aperture also that allows you also to get access to the characterization of uh, any beam diameter from very small tens of uh, microns uh, would be uh, um, a lower limit up to um, meters uh, field of view. You can work at any wavelength, which is uh, very convenient so that you can make the characterization and the quality control of your uh, micro optics at the wavelengths uh, they will be used. Um, and we are not limited to coherent source. And also the technology is very uh, insensitive to, is very robust because it's insensitive to vibration and uh, atmospheric turbulences. So it makes it a perfect tool for uh, shop floor measurement, for example, and to get very uh, close to the manufacturing line and not only uh, uh, limited by performing the metrology in an optical lab. So uh, the sensor is very versatile, you can use it uh, standalone, or you can uh, use it implemented in a bench, which is specific to the application uh, you have. And this is what I uh, propose we, we go through uh, different implementation that we made for customers in the, in the field of uh, uh, micro optics uh, fabrication. So the first case correspond to uh, the characterization of uh, micro lenses array that are produced by photolithographical technology. Um, so here uh, they are very, they are, they are small element. The pitch is around 100 micron. Um, and we are testing them after they are produced before being integrated in a more complex uh, system. So we are measuring uh, the, the freeform parameters uh, as they are needed. Uh, for the performance of the complex systems they are embedded uh, into. You can see also that uh, for this case, we are performing the characterization at different wavelengths in the red at uh, 635 nanometers and also in the green at uh, 532. 
Right? So this is part of the flexibility of the of the wavefront sensor I was uh, mentioning. Uh, second case of uh, implementation correspond um, uh, to a different moment in the life and in the development of the product. So here we are not testing directly uh, on the component, on the optical component. We are testing on the mold that is uh, used to produce them by uh, injection molding. Uh, so the images and, and the wavefront maps you have on the screen correspond to different uh, region of interest of the same mold. So it's a, it's a complex uh, mold. And on the left part of the screen, you can see some microstructures uh, with different arrangements. So here we are able to characterize uh, the properties, optical properties of these uh, microstructures. And on the right part of the screen, um, uh, we are characterizing a different region of the mold, which is more flat. And uh, here, what is interesting for the manufacturer is uh, Polish is the is the surface quality of the of the polishing in order to know that uh, if 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 the polishing is enough or, or they should um, improve the quality of the mold and uh, you can even distinguish uh, somehow the pattern that is left by the polishing tool. Okay, so here a different use case of the of the metrology. Third implementation case, it corresponds to the testing of uh, liquid lenses. So we are not uh, in the, we, we are not really in the micro uh, micro part of uh, micro range part of the of the optics. Liquid lenses, as uh, there are very small lenses that are implemented, for example, in cell phones, in in order to uh, take advantage of the capacity of change, uh, changing their focus and their power um, in order to perform features such as um, uh, zooming uh, or also uh, autofocus eh, in, in cell phones. So here, the, the Shackartman wavefront sensor um, is implemented in a pick and place uh, machine uh, on the production line. So every second, uh, micro, uh, liquid lenses are, are, are picked and, and placed in different um, uh, metrology station within the same uh, 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 control uh, machine. And uh, every second, uh, lenses are, are tested uh, for uh, focus capability and uh, also MTF. Um, uh, capability there. So, so the, the, the capability of a, a perfectly image um, uh, a scene. And the last case I wanted to, to, to bring to you is a very uh, new one. So it's very different um, uh, um, manufacturing process. In this case, um, uh, the microstructures are, are produced by uh, laser projection etching technology, meaning that um, the system presents two wavelengths. One wavelength uh, corresponds to a projection laser uh, that is um, uh, improving the efficiency of an etchant in order to, to, to create the shape of the of the optics and at the same time there is a second wavelength going through the optical part that allows us to make the optical metrology um, online in real time in order to control the, the really the, the, the fabrication process in in real time so so the idea the idea behind this is that you, you fabricate you measure then you compare uh, with your uh, target, and then you are able to adjust in real time uh, the, the, the system you are uh, producing uh, in order to get some, some kind of uh, on-the-fly correction, which improves uh, precision and also the, the throughput. So that's really a, a cool uh, implementation we, we made uh, lately. So as a conclusion, a few technical um, uh, aspects. I, I won't, won't go through through them. I let them there for you. Uh, but what I want to say is that um, Shackartman wavefront metrology allows you uh, to, um, uh, to, to to perform the metrology at any step of the development of the of the product and uh, its manufacturing. So starting at the prototype 
uh, phase, uh, validating so the prototypes, validating uh, designs and simulation, and then uh, controlling production tools such as mold, and uh, last, performing the metrology online, as I show you, but also uh, offline uh, to test the, the manufactured component, but also to, to do the quality control before integration in, in other systems. Okay, so I thank you very much for your for your attention, um, and and just a last word to say that we'll be at Laser World uh, Photonics at uh, Munich. So uh, you are very welcome uh, to to visit our booth and see our live uh, demos. And that's it. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much, Raphael, for this interesting presentation. I think it's also yeah really important to to show that you are not um, only dedicated to, to laboratory, but you are also able to provide some, some, some product for the uh, manufacturing process line. So yeah, really interesting um, for this market, of course. Uh, any question for, uh, for Raphael, please? Are you, are you already a part of the fabulous ecosystem, Raphael? So no, we are not part of the fabulous. Uh, we, we had a couple of safe change. We, we are just a proud member of uh, EPIC, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is already good. But yeah, yeah. I, I think that your, your place through the, the, the fabulous ecosystem uh, would, be, would be interesting because you provide something really, really interesting for this, for this industry, of course. Indeed. You, you said there was uh, money left for a few last uh, projects, so maybe something around yeah, yeah. astrology can, uh, can be envisaged. Yeah, sure. OK. so. I don't see any hand raising. So thank you again, Rafael. Thanks thank a lot you. for your presentation. And uh, now I would like to ask to uh, Kim. So with the uh, principal strategic business development uh, at Accetris, so Munsik, you can um, start your presentation, please. Hi, everyone, again. And thank you, Jeremy, for invitation and introduction. So today, uh, happy to talk about our micro optics and overview of applications from communication industry to consumer electronics. I hope many of you know uh, Acceptris. We are leading manufacturer of micro optics, including micro lenses, lens arrays, some other defective optical elements as well. We manufacture our micro optics product in house, MEMS foundry. So we have a capability of MEMS processes. So we offer as well wiper processing services as a separate from micro optics product service. So where we do typically uh, special metallizations, patternings, and structuring of microstructures on the wiper event. And maybe I will show you how we manufacture our micro lenses based on wiper event manufacturing process. So many of you, I know this, uh, I guess you know that this process. So we start with the photoresist in coating and make a lithographic patterning. Typically we make a cylindrical or like disc shaped structures in order to make a like melted lens. So when we uh, heat up the, this the three dimensional cylindrical pillars or over liquid temperature uh, around 150 degrees, it becoming like a water drop on the substrate. And uh, like this, polymers are formed as a lens shape. We transfer this shape to the substrate material. We use silicone or glass wafers. And while we are transferring this shape of the polymer lens to the substrate, we can change the shape slightly by edge rate uh, tuning. So we can do uh, aspherical lenses. And then we do the AR coating, singulation by uh, mechanical soda icing, visual inspections and taking place all automated. Like this, we make our micro optics products. Some examples are shown here. So we can make lenses or we can pattern lenses everywhere on the wafer like shown here. And then we can cut out or dicing out like single lenses like shown here or arrays. Another example of arrays as well. Or we can design properly one lens per chip for instance, this one, or several lenses per chip. This is a before dicing. So the grid of these four lenses will be the chip size. 
And then we can do as well uh, some cylindrical lenses like uh, shown here, like single lens or arrays. These cylindrical lenses are used for majority like laser diode coupling or collimating, specially separated with a slow and fast axis. And we can do as well uh, defective optical elements and gratings. Let's see where those micro optics product can be used. So we start from the communication industry uh, where we are very well known. So I just show you just the most uh, famous three examples like fiber connectors, transceivers, and WSS, uh, which is wavelength selective switches. You can imagine here fiber connector. When the fiber ends, always light diverges. So to the next fiber or devices, you need to use something to couple or collimate light uh, through the focus and through the next devices. In the prehistoric time of telecommunication, people used to use bolens which was uh, available at that time. But nowadays, uh, thanks to Acceptris and other, all other micro manufacturers, so industry can buy and use like uh, very well-defined, uh, high-performing micro lenses and affordable price. So I think the majority of these fiber connectors use now uh, micro optics, uh, micro lenses and lens arrays. And second uh, example is uh, telecommunication transceivers. Here I show some pictures. This is an example of a uh, most popular small form factor transceiver. Size is like a finger size. And inside, they are transmitting and receiving optical sub-assemblies called TOSA and ROSA. You can see the big image like that, but these like multi-channel coupling uh, optics are integrated in these small areas, which means that your, uh, your open space and distance from the devices are very small, typically millimeter or sub-millimeter uh, domain. So where you need to really the micro lenses to couple and collimate the light to the next devices. So this is the most popular one. And second one is uh, wavelength selective switches, which is a little bit more expensive and complex and a little bit lower volume uh, module compared to the transceivers. The function is very simple, channel, multi-channel, uh, in between like uh, in and out coupling or uh, switching uh, by using, for example, two dimensional micro lens arrays, the schematic is shown here, uh, or you can do as well arrays of a uh, laser diode uh, coupling to the devices. For example, this is a schematic as well. A laser diode has like elliptical beam output, which is a uh, fast axis is a uh, fast diverging and slow axis is a uh, slow diverging. So these two axes typically separated for the collimation using FAC, for example, this cylindrical lens bar is FAC, collecting all the arrays of this the elliptical beam fast axis. So this is called fast axis collimator. Then this, the black uh, rectangular is arrays of the laser diode. So this can be coupled with the slow axis array of cylindrical lenses as well. Typically they work together. So this kind of micro optics used in the wavelength selective switches. Maybe still, maybe you're wondering why I'm talking about communication, not the consumer electronics. I'm coming to that direction now. So I talked about the telecommunication industry, but in fact, consumers are using telephones since many years. Like this is, uh, this is a picture of a bell making long distance call 130 years ago, the most famous landmark of the London uh, like 30 years ago, not anymore, I guess like a telephone booth. We used to use telephone as a transporting signal and messages. This paradigm have, uh, has changed it now. Now, communication means light transport signal and messages via optical fibers. What does that mean? So all uh, devices and buildings and connections are done by optical fiber. In between like fiber to home, office, within office and home devices, and this one as well, connecting to the, our uh, famous uh, social media, uh, multi-billion user social media has been uh, has supported by hyperscale data center. Inside, as you can see here, a lot of storage devices are connected with the optical fibers. You know, in one word, I would call connectivity. How does it, uh, how has it been done? With micro optics using telecommunication transceivers or fiber connectors. So without micro optics, 
I can say a lot of these applications like social medias, cloud services. Uh, today's our meeting has been done with a video conference via Zoom. All these professional and personal uh, digital contents cannot be transferred. So in fact, the backbone of this old system has micro optics. And this is a part of our business. And so uh, from communication to the uh, consumer's digital, digital contents I talked about, but I will talk about another example, consumer electronics, where micro optics is in fact one of the enabling components. So popular 3D sensing in our daily life, you can think uh, like face ID in the smartphones and 3D cameras, which is now as well uh, implemented to the automotive lighter for autonomous driving. So let's see first like a uh, face ID. This is more genetically called, I think, structural delimitation. This is the example of the iPhone face ID, the IR camera picture, a lot of that shown our, uh, our face. But this one is in fact uh, more simply, uh, just let's imagine like a uh, line shape of the illumination can be projected on non-planar surfaces like this. Then this line shape, more technically called moiré lens, is deformed, which means these dots, well organized dots, where you know the position of the dot, but we will displace and deform. By collecting that information, you can retrieve your face shape. But this is not full three-dimensional measurement. Three-dimensional measurement can be done with a time of flight, uh, 3D cameras, which have been already implemented in many smartphones, from Android, Android devices to the Apple device. The former time, this the time of flight used to use this kind of illumination, just like our torchlight, Gaussian profile or Lambertian profile illumination. If the center is bright, and outside is weak, so the sensitivity is not good enough. So Apple, I think, start to leverage this uh, that illumination from face ID even to the time of flight illumination by using this kind of defective optical element, make organized that to enhance the sensitivity and performance of time of flight. And this smartphone devices time of flight maybe. Detection lens is five meters, up to five meters within like a room size of the areas. But this can be used to the automotive LiDAR if we can increase the detection range up to several hundred meters. This is an example. So I think many of you know the name Bellodyne made uh, this kind of the demonstration of uh, LiDARs using mechanical scanning or rotating, but in fact, this kind of illumination technique can be used in the LiDAR, which is called flash LiDAR. This is an example of the Canadian LiDAR manufacturer, LiDARTEC. Uh, their uh, emitter side, you can see here, small glass piece with lines. In fact, this is a cylindrical lens array. Cylindrical lens array can do beam shaping, for example, homogenized line beam generator. So this is used in order to have uh, minimum one line, homogeneous line to uh, reduce the scanning direction. For example, this is rotating 360 degrees or other scannings are like two dimensional scanning, but this one line can do only one scanning or uh, one axis scanning can fulfill uh, three dimensional measurement. So this was time of flight. But there is another, another example of the 3D camera, which is called light carpet or plan optic. So this is a, some like intuitive picture. How does it work? So if you have a multiple aperture of the imaging system with a slightly different uh, optical axis, you will collect all these uh, shifted images and uh, integrate them together. You can get 3D images, which is called these days light carpet or plan optic. How does it work? You just uh, simply high quality micro lens arrays on top of the image sensor, then you can uh, uh, you can record this all shifted integral imaging in one place. And then with the uh, computer processing, you can retrieve three, uh, three dimensional images. This is a uh, popular 3D camera in consumer electronics. So in fact, this was an overview of all applications today, what I want to talk. But in fact, micro optics applications are a lot more than just what I mentioned today. So let's move to the, my summary. My summary, I want to start with uh, two questions. Is micro optics new or is light field technique is new? 
maybe you know the answer. Michael Kickstart is not new. He says a more than uh, our human beings history, like uh, several hundred millions uh, history. Uh, like a uh, trilobite that this kind of compound eyes is inedited to flying insects compound eye. And then this compound eye as well, an insect developed to a little bit more advanced image lenses, like millimeter size, sub-millimeter size uh, lenses. This is a jumping powder, typically has a six or eight uh, imaging lenses like that. So this is no. Then next question, uh, light field is new. Answer is no as well. I hope uh, Jeremy and Raphael, you know, um, Gabriel Lippmann, I hope in your the optics education. So Nobel Prize winner, uh, Gabriel Lippmann proposed in fact, 125 years ago already integral photography. These days people call light field or plan optic, but this was, uh, uh, Gabriel Lindman was uh, naming as integrated photography using micro lens arrays. This is not my conclusion, in fact. So from here, what do we want to learn? So as well, I start with another question. Why they seem to be new? Or why did not hear about those applications 20 years ago? My answer is high volume stable supply of micro optics, like we do, except we do, and our Swiss friends in your shelter, so my optics, or like another hour with tempo print, they do. If we see our history, we are 25 years old. So my optics is uh, almost the same history, 25 years old. And tempo print is just 10 years old. So this uh, stable, high volume, uh, industrial supply of my optics was not available before. So, which means the industrial consumer electronics manufacturers could not offer to the clients or consumers uh, affordable price product. Now, because of this uh, uh, mutual industrial technique, we can support. So my conclusion is key enabler, key enabler in micro optics uh, related application is manufacturing maturity, like industrial players like Acceptris, just micro optics and Pentoprint and supply chain pilot line like Fabulous is really key enabler to make consumers enjoy and use this kind of a new gadget and application. So micro optics is everywhere, ubiquitous in our daily life. Let's enjoy it. That's all uh, I want to talk today. And we have a booth as well in Laser Munich. If you have a time, please stop by B1, number 400, uh, 451, and thank you. Thank you very much, Mitsing. And you can also uh, meet uh, Munsik during uh, the epic uh, uh, technical meeting during the world of photonics on microotics. We will have a presentation. So thanks a lot, uh, Munsik, for your um, presentation and this uh, nice overview. Um, any question, please, for Munsik? Maybe I, I have one, uh, Munsik. Uh, it, it was really interesting, and I would like to have your maybe your your opinion about uh, you know uh, what are the today the main challenges we have uh, you know uh, for micro optics um, technologies to 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 be really adopted by the you know the market and uh, also be used in every system. What what is the main challenges to the main challenge to overcome in the next few few years? Uh, I think manufacturing technologies are really uh, well established. Not only us, many. Uh, uh, many other companies like uh, foundries and they can make, uh, make as well nanostructures and metal lens, wave lights. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, the, so manufacturing of micro optics is kind of ready from my opinion and available, affordable. But the rest of our uh, supply chain is not ready for specific applications. For instance, AR, VR smart glasses. It's Yes, so many people say they can manufacture high volume with a very low price, but you can see still average price of a smart glass is like 3,000 US dollar. Me, I'm not affordable, uh, I'm not ready for paying $6,000 for smart glass. <laughs> so uh, for me, maybe the simple answer is maybe whole supply chain need to be, need to be ready to offer affordable price for very high volume for, uh, vast number of the consumers, not only selected which consumers. 
And yes, thank you, Mintik. Yes, Andreas, please, you can ask your question. Yeah, music, thank you for the great presentation. Um, you mentioned and, and showed that transceivers uh, are one of the main businesses where you use micro lenses, uh, also smart features. Um, now we are going into, you know, there's continuous evolution, there's the next generation of transceivers, new materials. So as these transceivers evolve in their um, technology, how they modulate, will this also have an impact on how you have to manufacture your micro lenses or can you just continue uh, with the basic setup? So yes, uh, maybe you are particularly mentioning maybe like uh, onboard optics or co-packaged optics where uh, they want to avoid to use micro optics. Definitely is a, in the business wise, this is a threat for us. So uh, in order to cover or in order to avoid problem in that uh, domain, we need to develop new product and new applications. So we are working for some new technologies and some uh, uh, like uh, efforts for making new application areas. Uh, so we call diversification program. So we are going there. This is unavoidable. You know, the new technology will reduce the micro lens uh, usages and making more integrated. Uh, everything integrated on a chip, uh, laser diode and detectors. So eventually the time will come. I don't know when, but one thing I can say is in business wise as well, we heard about this co-packaged optics and onboard optics last 10 years. So still not there, really there yet. I see more and more demonstrations, product are released, but still low volume. So we may have still maybe three to five years more uh, industry will need microptics, but after that, definitely other technologies or components will phase out or phase us out. So we need to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Andres, for your question. And thanks again, uh, Nimsik, for your interesting presentation. And I look forward to, to meet you during the World Photonics again. Um, before to ask to Al to start your presentation, uh, I see that we have Jessica Van Eyck, so managing director. In Zoom, so Jessica, can you can you just uh, maybe introduce yourself shortly, a few words? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm sorry I uh, was not able to attend the first part of the meeting, but uh, yeah. So my name is Jessica Van Eck. I'm the managing director of the Pilot Line Association. So uh, really the entry point into the services of all the partners behind Fabulous, uh, both from the members as well as the ecosystem. So. Uh, uh, really, we want to make uh, specifically also freeform micro optics easily accessible. And uh, we have a great group of partners that can handle services from design to origination, replication, integration, etc. So, uh, and uh, I, I think you already mentioned because I heard someone reference it, the open call. So uh, we have also uh, as part of the project funding available for companies looking to implement freeform micro optics. Yes, thank you, Jessica. Maybe you can um, put your again your your email address in the the chat. Um, it would be great. So thanks a lot for this introduction. And uh, now I would like to, to welcome uh, Harald Gishen uh, from the University of Stuttgart. So Harald, you you can start your presentation. The floor is yours. So. One second. Yeah. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, that's good. You can start. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Harald Giesen. I'm at University of Stuttgart, and I am also part of um, Print Optics GmbH, which is which is located here in um, in Stuttgart in Germany. Um, what you see on the first slide is um, an image of a wasp uh, that I killed on my window. And we have some of the um, aspheric multiplet optics that we 3D print with two photon poly photopolymerization and also uh, recently put into the metallic casings and have uh, stops and irises and so on in there. Um, that I will show you how we do that and uh, how consumers can. Uh, or companies can uh, profit from these uh, 3D printed optics. So what we do at uh, print optics is um, the customer comes to us 
and um, tells us uh, his problem. And then we will come up with an optimal design, an optimal optical design and the simulation. We do ray tracing as well as wave simulation. 3D printed optics gives many more freedoms compared to classical optics where you have more um, spherical optics usually, but we can uh, print also, we can 3D print, um, so to say, uh, impossible parts that normally would not be possible to make by um, classical optics. Then we do the structural design, which is also quite important because the 3D printed optics needs to have, for example, some openings when you develop the polymer resin and we um, develop then the process for 3D printing. We are using a nanoscribe to photon uh, 3D printer and um, we do also the process development. Then we print um, a few prototypes and we measure, for example, with confocal uh, surface profiling, but lately also with uh, wave measurements, we measure the performance of the optics. And then from these deviations that we get from the original optic design, we put in a shape correction and print uh, new prototypes. And after uh, two, three iterations, we converge usually to lambda over 10 accuracy. Then we offer a prototyping service. Anything between uh, five to 5,000 prototypes uh, is currently available. And we are uh, aiming at going up to the tens of thousands of prototypes. And in the end, uh, we uh, have measurement and analysis of the optical and imaging performance. Then we um, have the feedback with the customer whether this uh, design fits the customer's needs and uh, we might have to go to design improvements. I'll show you um, uh, how it works. So it's a femtosecond laser at 800 nanometers. It focuses down um, into a tiny focus and that tiny focus here, this so-called voxel, um, leads to the photopolymerization. The laser is at 800 nanometers, and that means two photons at 800 nanometers are being absorbed by the photoresist and uh, cure the photoresist as if there was one photon of 400 nanometers. However, if this was a 400 nanometer laser beam, that would normally polymerize everything. But if we have two 800 nanometer photons, we only polymerize the voxel. It is typically 160 nanometers in diameter and about 400 nanometers in height. So um, the nanoscribe uh, system actually facilitates this because there the Galvo scanner, the software and everything is built in. Now I'll show you some uh, examples. For example, lenses on fibers. We can use, for example, 600 micrometer diameter multi-core fibers. Here you see these multiple cores and each of the cores is single mode. So they are able to transfer an image from one side to the other. Here you see an aspheric doublet printed onto the end of that multi-core fiber. Oops. Seems that's hard at some connection problem. It might, be the, might be the wasp uh, that took a revenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we will go to the next speaker maybe um waiting for our uh, yeah okay he has been disconnected um so andreas please can you can you maybe start uh your presentation if you are if you are ready yes i can start sorry I'm for this not 100 percent ready 99 ready <laughs> so, uh, let me quickly pull up the slides We're going to try to 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 contact uh, Harold. Hello, can you still hear me? Ah, okay, <laughs> so sure. Okay, yeah, so uh, off for some reason. I try again. Uh, did you still hear me uh, talking about the uh, imaging fibers here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And did you hear okay, me talking about the three hundred forty micron imaging uh, here? Okay, let, let, let's maybe share your your, your yeah. Okay. Your slides, sorry, Andreas. Excuse me. 
No, no, let, let's start sharing your, your slide, uh, Howard. Oh, does it not share? Okay. No, 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 because you have been disconnected, I guess. Oh my God. And oh, one, one second, I need, I need that, um, that Zoom thing here so that I can share where, where is the, thank you. Oh man, one second, one second. <laughs> what is happening here? Oh, here. No, not this arrow for sharing. Where is the arrow for sharing? You don't have the arrow, it's a green arrow at the bottom. Maybe you were... Oh, here, green. Okay. Do you see it again? It seems that it works. Yeah, you can, you yeah. can continue. Please. I'm very sorry about that. I did not do anything no at the university. It should work fine. So, um, okay. But you see here um, that had you seen this me describing the uh, 340 micron uh, endoscope and the imaging uh, here? Yeah, I think you can start. Uh, yeah. Okay. And yeah. then here on the uh, right hand, you see the current state of the art. So there is a match. These were the endoscopes that were uh, commercially available. And here is the endo endoscope that we, disc uh, that we uh, uh, supply and we can provide. So it is 340 micron in diameter. It is 120 degrees field of view. It is distortion free. You see the imaging quality here. And as I said, it is uh, mechanically and chemically protected and it is uh, biocompatible. So it is tested that uh, we do not uh, create any problems. So here you can see the lenses that we can put, for example, on a little micro camera, on a Sony or on a uh, Omnivision imaging chip um, in the metal casing that has a 90 degree field of view, an F4 um, opening and a 1.1 millimeter uh, on the outer diameter. And here are some uh, example pictures through the lens with different targets. What is also possible is that with uh, the 3D printing to photon photopolymerization, we directly print onto imaging sensors. Here on the left, you see a two by three millimeter imaging sensor. And on the right, you see on the imaging sensor, a multi aperture camera with printed lenses that are actually using the shine fluke condition, which means that the lenses individually are slanted and therefore cover a full 180 degree uh, range of view uh, because you combine now the picture out of these uh, five or more lenses that look in different directions. So hybrid lenses, we can make, for example, refractive diffractive hybrids. And um, it is possible, you see here a refractive lens and on the next one, you have another refractive surface. And additionally, you can print here a um, diffractive optical element on top of it that has the opposite dispersion than your material. And therefore you correct for the color. It is also possible to combine two different resists. Here we have the resist IPS and the resist IPDIP. They are both from the company Nanoscribe and they have different refractive indices, but what is more important, they have also different dispersions. And that means that the combined uh, counter dispersion in combination with a uh, convex concave design gives a so-called Fraunhofer doublet. And you can see this without color correction. You have actually on one side here, some red and on the other side, some blue edge, but with a color correction that is shown here in this Fraunhofer doublet, which is 3D printed, there is no color dispersion. So both by using one material, IPS plus the additional diffractive element, or using the two different materials, you can correct for the chromatic aberration. And you can see when we print such an axicon here, in one case with only one material, you have the rainbow for the color um, dispersion. And with the axicon that is here uh, color corrected with the two materials, there is um, no uh, chromatic aberration. It is also possible to print beam shapers directly on top of the lens. For example, you have a single mode fiber, you print some optics where the beam can propagate a little bit, and then on top you can print a 3D hologram. And that hologram can have the uh, Fourier transform of the image that you desire. And it is possible, for example, to make this little robot for lasers or this Batman shape, or 
even for white light, have a projection of a logo here. It is also possible to make illumination optics, for example, replace this huge epoxy here that you have for the LED with a tiny little uh, 3D printed optics that acts as a concentrator and you have a six fold increase in your uh, il illumination. Also, it is possible to make stitched arrays. So for example, on this sensor here, you can print the individual optics, have either the same optics or change the optics uh, differently as you want. Recently, we have also introduced colored resins, and that means you can include directly into your printing the color filter, for example, like a Bayer filter of red, green, and blue. You can also have total internal reflection designs. Here, for example, is a fiber plus a piece that is 3D printed on top of it where the beam expands. Then comes here on the side a freeform mirror, and that freeform mirror then sends your beam out. That can have, for example, a very narrow numerical aperture beam for optical coherence tomography. And this is the sample where the optics is rotating on the fiber and then scans around uh, the environment with optical coherence tomography. Additionally, what you can do if you use a double clad fiber, you can print an optics here. In this case, you see this blue uh, beam that has a very high NA, in this case 0.8, and collects, for example, extreme amounts of fluorescence. So you have simultaneously inside a narrow beam and uh, on the outside a high NA collection efficiency and everything is all just on the all, uh, uh, size of 100 microns as you see down here. And the total diameter is only 520 microns. Um, what, we, oops, what we have done with this, um, we can also have these total internal reflection designs for extreme focusing, for example, for optical trapping lenses, where you have um, uh, numerical apertures uh, approaching 0 0.9 or even more than 0 0.9. We did this for um, optical trapping of beads and also optical trapping of cells. And recently with this design, we have also uh, optically trapped atoms. What are our typical specs? For example, objective one here, um, you can have um, the objective is the objective that you use in the 3D printer that has a high NA. There you have a 250 by 250 micron right field. The working distance is 300 micron. This is your voxel shape. It's a very small voxel and then you stitch together and you have different materials. I mentioned already the IP dip, IPS, and then there is a high index uh, resist 1.62 called IPN162. Voxel sizes 160 nanometers laterally and 450 nanometers longitudinally. The Galvo can position the accuracy by better than 20 nanometers. This is a second objective that you can use for writing 500 by 500 microns, working distance 700 micrometers. Stitching is also possible. And there, another additional resist is available IP Visio, which is a very clear resist and which polymerizes very fast. There, the voxels are a little bit bigger. And then we have a low NA writing objective with 1.5 by 1.5 square millimeters right field, a working distance of 700 micron stitching is possible. And additionally to the previously mentioned resists, also IPQ is possible, which stands for IP quick. So it very quickly polymerizes. The company consists of uh, Simon Thiele and Niels Fabach who have many years of experience in micro optics, in optics design, uh, uh, over seven patents and over 30 publications in this field. And Niels Fabach also has the technical background in the engineering and um, is our business manager. We are also exhibiting at Laser World of Photonics next week at booth B1239. So please come and visit us, tell us your requirements, tell us your um, necessities which you like uh, to have, and we can discuss whether it's possible with um, the uh, process that I described. Also, you can visit our website at www.printoptics.com. And um, this is the process that we offer, and we would be very happy to print your 3D printed uh, optics, freeform optics for you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Harald, for, for your presentation. It was really interesting to, to, to understand and see your, your technology. Um, any question, please, for, for Harald? Raphael? Yeah. yeah, I might have a question. Could, could, you, comment on the, um, could you comment on the throughput uh, of, the, of the printing? How many? 
lenses you can you can produce? Uh, it depends, of course, on the um, size of the volume that you have and on the complexity. There are certain tricks that one can use, for example, 3D print only the surfaces and harden what is in between uh, by UV flashing afterwards. Or what is possible, carefully print the surfaces with a very high resolution and inside print more like a scaffold, like a sponge type structure that gives the mechanical support and then later harden it. And therefore, the throughput uh, becomes much higher. So right now, we are at a printing time of roughly 15 minutes per lens that you have seen. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Yes, uh, Elena Sokolova, please. Yeah, uh, my question may be a little bit specific, but uh, I would like to know more about the materials you use for fiber lenses. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our application is uh, related to Raman scattering, mm -hmm. and that is why we are very much limited by materials we can use, mm -hmm. and mainly we use few silica lenses and fibers, and uh, well, most printed components are made of, on plastic, and uh, all plastics have very high Raman background. Have you any any solution which may be suitable for us? Mm -hmm. So um, we have actually not characterized the Raman background. Of all the nanoscribe resists, there are some publications, partially by our group, um, where we have characterized the fluorescence background. And it turns out the material that has the lowest fluorescence, and I would guess, and I would estimate that probably it has also a low Raman cross-section, that is actually Ormocom. So Ormocomp from the company Microresist Technology has usually a very, very low fluorescence. It can hardly be detected. And I would assume that this has a low Raman cross-section, but it's a very good suggestion. We have never done this. I should just print some samples, give it to our Raman group, and then could quantify um, where we have the Raman lines as well as how much is the Raman cross-section. This is a very good suggestion. I write it down. And uh, maybe it's possible to send us some sample of your material and we will measure it. Oh, no problem at all. Uh, just uh, contact us at Print Optics or enter my name in Google Harald Giesen and send me an email. You will find uh, it. And then it will, um, uh, I'm very happy to print some lenses for you with the different materials and you can put it into your Raman application. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Elena, for the question and suggestion. Maybe you can uh, you can put your email address around in the in the chat, the Zoom chat. Okay. No yes, I will. Um, thank you again, Harald. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, now, yeah, I want to, to welcome uh, finally Andreas uh, Volker from uh, the CSCM, um, so Research and Business Development in Photonics. So, Andreas, you can now start your presentation. Oh, uh, now for real. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Let me quickly pull out the sharing. And I think you see the wrong screen probably. Okay, it's it's not it's not the good uh, the good not one. The presentation mode. Yeah. Now it should be right. Good. Yes. So thank you for having me today. I'm Andreas Berger uh, from CSCM. Um, I do the business development photonics at CSCM. So that covers a wide range of uh, photonic applications from lies, lasers to pigs, but also micro lenses. Uh, and I'll be talking about micro lenses specifically today and how they can enhance the utility in photon detection. Maybe just quickly uh, as an introduction, uh, because we're not a company, uh, CSCM is a public private nonprofit through technology innovation center. So what we do is basically we sell projects. We bring technology, high-tech technology into products. And we've been doing this for more than 30 years. Uh, on the left side is a typical example uh, of what we do. So you see that we've got a, a smartwatch. So it actually has a, that's a screen on the background and it's also photovoltaic. So this is one of the, uh, the only smartwatch I think that can run basically indefinitely. So um, it's uh, powered by photovoltaics, whereas if you take a, uh, um, an Apple Watch, uh, I think you have to charge it every Okay. Uh, we do more than uh, 200, we have 200, more than 200 industrial customers per year and do more than 300 projects per year. So we also have a very high um, quantity of returning 
customers. And uh, the, what, what um, signifies us is that we, we really have the experts long-term. So um, unlike universities where the PhD students change every three years, uh, our personnel is to 80% long-term uh, contracts. As it's, uh, and of course, we have all these project management experience also qualified in ESO or for medical devices. We're about uh, reaching 600 people, 46 nations in the last count. Uh, we're also improving our uh, quantity of women on board. 35% of our uh, employees have a PhD. Uh, the majority of the rest are engineers. And uh, the technologies that we cover are, are quite vast. So you have, we have these three main pillars, digital technology, precision manufacturing, and sustainable energy, and photonics is specifically in precision manufacturing. But of course, you can imagine photonics is quite a, it's an enabling technology. So you can also see there, for example, quantum technologies, and photonics is, of course, a, a core component of quantum technologies today. If we look at the photonics at CSCM, uh, we can classify here between the core components uh, of which one is the micro nano optics, uh, but also we do LNOI picks, for example, image sensors. Then we have the technologies where we have our know-how. This includes machine learning and AI algorithms applied to photonic solutions with all the classical tools like ZMAX, COMSOL, PIC design, and of course, multispectral processing. And then we're going to the full system integration. We class or we classify between lasers, cameras, leaders, and sensing system modules. And then, of course, we are embedded in the European Partnership, and we're very proud to be a member also of Fabulous, but also MedFab or the Photon Hub Europe. Uh, we are a member, and of course, we're embedded in the uh, associations um, like EPIC, but also Optica or Photonic 21. And now let me come to micro and nano optics finally. Um, so I'll be talking about the micro lenses, how you can use them to enhance um, a detection, but uh, it has a wide range of other applications. So on the left side, you see a predominantly, so let me quickly get the laser pointer here. Here you see nano structured um, and nano optics, then going further to the right, you get larger structures, also preform optics, and all of these are very different application fields. Um, to change back. Okay, here we go. Um, so yes, uh, um, it's not only optics that you can do, but there are uh, applications far away uh, from that where you could not even imagine it maybe it's uh, these are here showing surgical pictures uh, that help the adhesion on the human skin that's really a wide field of applications for these micro nanostructures um, originally more than 20 years ago our main application was for example in security features it's still a very big field so uh, uh, you know Every day uh, in the world, millions of people are holding banknotes in their hand, which probably have a technology developed by CECM in them, nanostructures to make them safe. Um, I also want to mention uh, one field, which is not an enhancement of the light, but actually where you guide light. So it was also mentioned previously, I believe the light carpets. And I want to point this out because here we are really seeing um, a development going from in the past, we had aesthetic features predominantly, everybody knows the light carpet of BMW, um, but today we are actually moving to functional features. And here you can see, I believe, the Lucid Air there in Le Chatel where I am today, you can test drive this car. And here you're really going using micro optics now, not for aesthetic purposes, but you show the functionality. The, the size of the front lights has really drastically been reduced here um, and also enhancing uh, the illumination power. Here. So in automotive, we see that micro optics are now coming from aesthetics and moving to functionality. And in future, we actually hope that micro optics can support dynamic features such as indicators where a car is turning, for example. And uh, we believe that uh, this is certainly something that will 
we remain uh, in the automotive industry. Uh, it's not only, we don't only have micro intense, by the way, in the Lucid, which is for the high end, but also, for example, from Korea, Hyundai, I believe, uh, has recently integrated this in the headlines. So this is something where we can see a lot of dynamics recently. I use this picture from Swiss Micro Optics. Uh, they're the colleagues were also in the fabulous association and based it up here in Le Chatel. Um, also a provider like, excellent provider like Axetris of Micro Optics. And now I finally come to the actual topic. So how do we look, use micro lenses to enhance detection? This is a very specific application. So um, just to take you through the process again, I won't, I won't explain every step. But what I want to emphasize here is that it's really, we've got nine steps here, probably actually more than that. Uh, every step of this requires specific know-how and years of experience to do this properly for each application. And if only if you can master all those steps, you can really implement complex designs that can then be taken to industrial scale manufacturing level. So, and of course you can't do everything here on the right, we're showing a bit the limitations. So here, for example, we can do a hemispherical or full, nearly full spherical lenses. You can see there at the top, like balls sitting on top of the wafer, but uh, there's also limitations to that. So also every project, when we're going into microlens systems, it's uh, we can do a lot, but not everything yet. Uh, and it basically always needs specific know-how to realize such a project. Um, the, the overall process uh, is then, um, let's say once you've done all the design and which we can support you at CSCM, you do the origination, the tooling, the prototyping. And then for example, as we have seen, you can use the equipment for more photonic to do upscaling to uh, the equipment that has more than six inch cells. And then you can have your pilot production. And here you can also then go to larger scales. And here's fabulous, is then an excellent partner also to bring you to larger volumes. And now let's have a look at a specific case. Huh? So here we now have a, an, an image array and you can see the micro lens uh, array, which is put on top of this. Huh? You can see the scale here approximately. It's a bit small, it's 10 micron here. Um, so uh, the lens itself is a bit larger than 10 micron. I think it was 40. And then you put this on a, a detection um, array. And uh, in, in this way, in this case, you have a, this was a six inch die. Uh, you can enhance uh, the, the light flow to the detector. And this can be used uh, in both ways. Huh? So you can use it to enhance, but you can also uh, use it to shape light on the outgoing way. I showed you the automotive example. Um, and for the detector specifically, it's interesting for spots, CCD, and CMOS. And I'll show you a few more examples here in the next slides. So how does it work for a, a pure image detector? So there, of course, you have you have different versions of, of, of detectors. You have uh, front uh, side illumination and you have back side illumination. In both cases, you can reach an enhancement of the detection. Uh, so uh, Typically, if you have such a, a detection area, you only have a certain area uh, which is active, by where you can count the photons. Let me take the uh, pointer here. You can see here light coming from the top. And then here, for example, because you have the metal wiring, uh, photons are rejected. They don't reach it to the active area. And due to this, you lose sensitivity. And by placing lenses in a clever way here directly on top of this wafer, you can enhance the light that is directed to each single pixel detection unit. And this works in both ways. Huh? So here we have uh, also, uh, we have front and back illuminated examples. So here you can see how more light is then added to the specific pixel where you want to have detected because here in this case, you have a, you have a distance here from the actual active area and by placing a micro lens here, you can enhance the light that is supposed to go to each pixel.
We can do tricks to enhance this. So uh, one is, of course, you want to always uh, reduce the gap here to get a, a higher density of the micro lenses that you're using. Uh, here we have something which is down to approximately half a micron, 527 nanometers. I think we can do a bit better that, than that in the meantime. And with this, then we can get, of course, optimal illumination. Uh, we can have all kinds of structures here. Here we have some hexagonal example uh, with a pitch of 23 microns. And then you can have also lens shapes which are uh, no longer actually a lens so you have overlapping lenses and this also makes sense in some cases uh, where you can use these overlapping structures to enhance your um, illumination and so here you have non-circular or you could even say uh, freeform lenses So those are just some examples of tricks that you can use to get the optimum performance. Uh, then how much can you actually achieve in performance? Uh, depends, of course, on, on, on many factors. Uh, so here we had a, a, an example of a spot imager. So um, I actually, I should have explained, uh, excuse me, it's a single photon avalanche diode. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the units that you use to detect Photons, single photons, and today you can make these in arrays, and then you can get a, a full image, a SPAT image. Um, and here in this case, you have about 28% film factor. So you have 28% of that area which is active. And now, if you put micro lenses on top of this to guide the light to the active area, you can basically enhance the performance by factor three of the light being guided to the detection area. Which makes approximately sense. If you have 28% only fill area, that means tripling that is three times that is about where you get at the maximum of performance. And on the right side, you see a bit of the, um, these are simulations uh, of what you can achieve depending on the residual head and the sag of the micro lenses. And we have actual measurements in there. So we do actually get up to those high factors that were simulated here for this specific. Uh, lens. We can do this also for uh, other fill factors. So here going down to 5% fill factor. And of course, there that you can significantly enhance the performance. Um, I don't want to go into the details how you calculate this. Um, but basically, what I want to say is that every specific image or surface needs an own simulation, own expertise to make this work, and then you can design the optimum micro lens array system to achieve the maximum performance here. And it depends here, for example, we have plotted the F number of the concentration factor you can achieve, and you see here in the you know, best case here going up to 10 uh, in concentration factor or close to that line. We can also do this for very special cases here. So here you have like a chessboard and you can also make a chessboard a micro lens system to fit this. As mentioned before, you can do hexagonal, you can do circular. So there's no limitation in how you geometrically distribute these lenses. Now let me show you an example where how this actually then enhances the performance. This was one of the first cases here back in 2018 where we had an early spot array. Uh, this was used for bioimaging. Uh, this is only 320 by 240 pixels, and we designed the specific microlens system for this. And you can see up there uh, the, the, the image, the spot without the micro lenses, and then the spot with the micro lenses. Uh, if you're not an expert, maybe it does, it looks very similar to you, but for the expert, this is a, a significant improvement. And you see then down there, if we measure this, uh, you've got the blue line starts without the micro lenses, and then photon count with uh, in red. And you can see a significant enhancement here of the detection of the light. And, here as a, a reference, we had SCMOS. So we're getting close to SCMOS performance here. And 
all of this, of course, uh, is um, accessible through Fabulous, as we have learned today. Um, but within Fabulous, uh, we can even go further than what you have been able to do in the past. Um, uh, so CSEM has also been uh, increasing its abilities here uh, to also enhance volume, uh, take you to even larger um, industrial or closer to industrial production. Uh, we have the step and repeat now in place here at CSCM, which allows you then to multiply the micro lens production by stepping and repeating um, a certain structure. So how does that work? So once you have your your master to, to imprint, huh? you print that on your uh, resin, you cure that, and then you move it over step next and uh, perform the same procedure again. And if you do that well, uh, you can do this, for example, here we have an example of these are three by three centimeters, then doing that five by five times, reaching 15 by 15 square centimeters. And that's nearly seamless then uh, the replication of the structures here. So very high um, performance here by step and repeat. And uh, yes, the lower image, this is from one of our partners, uh, you are Neom Research within Fabulous. So you can see how these boils then um, look like, and uh, we can produce really larger volumes here. And then also if you go to roll to plate, that depends on the, the, the actual precision that you need or what is actually required, that is an alternative um, way of manufacturing. So with that, I'm already at the summary. Um, so if you have a lens array, a, a detection array, as specifically if you have a spud array where you every photon counts, the micro lenses clearly enhance the photonic detection. Uh, we have a wide range of applications when you're going to such uh, imaging detectors. As I mentioned, all kinds of uh, geometries, hexagonal, circular, uh, normal chessboard even. Each of them can be enhanced by using micro lenses there. And we are even moving beyond that for specific applications, space applications, for example, or we have been at CERN to enhance the uh, detector there. And also that is uh, showing excellent results here at the CERN, for example, for this LHCB detector, I, I believe we increased the performance by 15%. And that for CERN was a huge downfall. So yes, if you have, if you have a, 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 an error and you want to make, and it's already an excellent um, quantum efficiency, but you want to go even higher, then come to talk to us. This is in our core expertise of bringing that also to industrial level. And together with Fabulous, you can even that stronger, you can offer more in combination with all the partners that you have on board. Um, now, some of the credits, as I mentioned, I, I cover the business development of all the photonics. Uh, this specific area of making micro lens arrays for detection is the field of Frederick Zanella. Um, he's on holidays today, so he excuses himself. Um, he sent me, I, I hope I did a worthy job of representing him, but you do, if you do have questions, you can directly contact Frederick um, around putting micro lens, uh, lens arrays onto detection units. And yes, we'll also be, of course, at the Laser World of Photonics, our booth is A2, 525. So please do come by. Also, if you have questions, maybe to the other technologies that I mentioned before, photonic integrated circuits, specific lasers, uh, optoelectronic systems, LIDAR, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you. So um, our core message at CSCM for our industrial partner is uh, don't face the challenges alone. It's a dynamic environment. It's getting ever faster. Partner with us uh, to bring you to the next technology level or uh, implement your technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas, for, for your interesting presentation um, on this application. So um, 
Yeah, maybe one question, short question for Andreas, but I would like, since we're running a little bit late, I would like to maybe to go forward with our next and uh, last speaker of the day. So if you have any question for, for Andreas, please um, you can contact him afterward, or you can also contact him through, through Zoom. So thanks again, Andreas, for your presentation. Um, and yes, uh, Sanjay uh, from ANSYS, so you can, you can start sharing your screen and, and your presentation. Thank you. Yes, can I confirm uh, that you can see that? Uh, yeah, you can start. Okay, yes. excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate this opportunity uh, to speak here today. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, my name is Sanjay Gangadhara. I'm a senior program director from the ANSYS Optics Organization. Um, I think you know this introduction I'll go through quickly because I think we've seen throughout today's workshop just many examples of the value of freeform optics and in driving innovation within optical product design across the industry, um, across a variety of applications. Uh, while this session focused here on consumer electronics, uh, you know whether that's in mobile displays, and we heard about that a bit earlier in the in the workshop, uh, lots of also interesting topics around communications, uh, around uh, automotive, around um, other applications as well. So we're seeing really freeform optics and freeform micro optics play a key and critical role um, in delivering the next generation of optical devices. Um, what we're finding increasingly, and as, as we've seen throughout today, is that consumer electronics applications require smaller and smaller components. We're really looking to miniaturization of these devices as we're looking to go from uh, large systems to handheld to wearables um, and beyond, right? And so we really need to drive towards miniaturization. And of course, so micro optics uh, will continue to play an important role in that. You know, I think there was some uh, mention that uh, eventually we may be going fully towards onboard or even co-packaged solutions in the future. You know, I tend to agree, I think uh, with uh, Myun-Sik here that that's still some time away. And I think there still is an opportunity as we uh, think about free form uh, diffract, you know, whether these are refractive or diffractive components uh, continuing to play an important role here um, in the next you know, decade or even potentially longer um, in these designs. Um, we believe that, you know, being able to have successful design of these tools requires the ability to uh, both analyze as well as to visualize the results of, the, of that performance. And especially in consumer electronics applications, I think there was a comment made earlier that um, the user experience, what the user will see when they're uh, looking at the display uh, is gonna be critically important to the performance of that display. So it's not just about quantitative metrics, but it's also about that user experience and that visualization. And so that is critical to understanding uh, how uh, the system will, will perform. And so to drive that, you really need to be able to, to model or to be able to simulate that. And so, you know, what I want to talk about here for the next few slides is really how simulation uh, plays a key role in really driving this innovation that we're seeing uh, with the use of freeform microoptics inside of the consumer electronics uh, industry. Um, and specifically, I'll be focused on the tools that we have here at ANSYS, um, where we have a broad range of multi-physics simulation tools available. Um, you know, here I'll be, of course, focusing on those tools, technologies in the optics and photonics area, uh, but, you know, that the idea here is that um, within ANSYS, we have a, a broader range of tools to support general multi-physics simulation um, that can be important for these applications um, in a broader sense. And so um, while I won't touch upon that, you know, certainly areas like electronics, um, uh, mechanical packaging, power consumption, these are all of course also important topics as we think about uh, consumer devices. Uh, but in this talk, I'll be focusing primarily on the optics. Uh, within ANSYS Optics, we have a, a portfolio uh, or a platform uh, for conducting a multi-scale, multi-physics simulation of optical devices. Um, and that goes from the nano scale all the way up to the system level scale. So at the nano scale, uh, we have tools from ANSYS Lumerical, which are focused on photonic component modeling at the nano or the microscopic level. Uh, these are primarily electromagnetic solvers uh, that allow you to design uh, components, you know, such as waveguides, um, such as diffractive um, meta surfaces, meta lenses, um, gratings uh, that really uh, interact with light at that wavelength scale. At 
somewhat more of the macroscopic component level scale. We have tools from ANSYS ZMAX. Um, Optic Studio is our flagship product there uh, that's used to do um, design analysis, simulation, uh, and tolerance analysis. So being able to account for manufacturing and assembly errors as a part of the system uh, design is an important part of getting a, a good system design. And so this uh, set of tools that we have available at ZMAX really enable uh, the support of the design of those macroscopic components. And then finally with ANSYS SPIOS, we have a set of tools that in addition to being able to do component level design for lighting and illumination systems. So some of the light guides, for example, uh, that we were uh, seeing earlier uh, in this workshop uh, as a part of the display technologies, um, but also being able to bring together both the, the nanoscopic and the macroscopic component level uh, simulation into a system level model so that you can actually do full 3D visualization of the system performance um, inside of the actual environment in which that system is going to be deployed. And as we've seen, this is an important part of um, system analysis. Um, and, and analyzing the performance of these optical systems. Um, so what I want to just talk to, and just really in the, in the last few minutes I have here, are just to talk about the workflow of design and simulation of consumer electronics devices, where we see the need for these different multi-scale and multi-physics pieces, and how we can bring them together inside of a simulation environment to really drive a comprehensive and complete simulation uh, tool chain uh, for these applications. So, so in this case, I'm uh, going to just be demonstrating a workflow for the design of a smartphone camera module, right? So that involves many different components, if you think about it, just even in, within the optics. And so within the optical design, there's the lens stack. So the actual, uh, in, in many cases, micro lenses or the micro optics that are being used to form the, form the image uh, in the smart, uh, smartphone camera. Uh, then there's the packaging of that lens stack. How do you actually put that together inside of the physical module that's gonna sit inside of the smartphone? Um, as you bring this, these lenses into that packaging, you have to account for uh, what we call so-called stray light. So this is the impact of unintended light paths making their way through the system uh, because of interaction uh, either with the optomechanics, so with the mechanical geometry that's holding the lens stack in place, or because of uh, out of field sources. So if you're looking at, for example, um, trying to take a, a picture with your smartphone, but it's in a bright sunlit room or sunlit environment, I should say, you know, how do you account for the impact of sunlight on the image quality? And then we also have the impact of structural and thermal analysis. And so this is looking at now how structural and thermal loads on the optics can impact the performance of those optical systems. These can be from the mounts themselves. So the mounts will impart stress uh, on the optics as they're being mounted. Um, this can be for thermal loads inside of the optics. So if you have heating, internal heating inside of the cell phone lens, um, or inside of the cell phone, I should say, that's causing heating the lenses, that can cause a degradation of the performance. And so being able to analyze that is critical. Then uh, get this light to an imager. And so you have to be able to model that, that sensor that's capturing the light. And so being able to define um, what you know, as we as we just saw in the in the previous talk from Andreas, you know, uh, micro lenses are often being deployed on top of these CMOS image sensors or these other sensors to be able to improve the performance and the efficiency of these sensors. And so, being able to design and simulate these micro lens arrays, optimize their their shape, their position is critical to maximizing efficiency. Being able to account for color filtering, right? So, what is what is the wavelength performance? Um, of these micro lenses is also uh, critically important. And then we need to be able to bring that all together again into a, into a system analysis, right? So being able to account for not just the optical components and how they um, funnel light again from the scene to the sensor, being able to account for sensor performance, sensor efficiency, but then what is then the final produced image uh, that will be generated by, by the smartphone. And so being able to bring that in uh, into an integrated fashion is critical to really being able to design high performance, uh, a high performance imaging system. And so this really just lays out the different aspects of the workflow and the design of what 
on the face of it would seem to be a fairly simple system. Um, and you can see different pieces that are involved here. And, and really on this next slide, I just highlight that these different pieces really require different purpose-built tools to be able to do this design and simulation, whether that's the tools from Lumerical at the nano or the micro optic component level where you're looking at the design of the micro lens array of the color filters, whether the, those are the tools from ZMAX, which allow you to do the lens stack optimization, which allow you to do the structural and thermal analysis of that lens stack accounting for, uh, accounting for those structural and thermal loads, or whether that's then moving into the area of the packaging, the optomechanics, the stray light analysis, um, which is well suited for the SPIOS tools. And finally SPIOS, which allows you to do that full, full scene visualization. So these, these really are the different pieces to the puzzle that need to be brought together uh, for uh, the generation of a robust uh, smartphone camera module design. Um, another example that I just wanna to touch upon is uh, an example for an augmented reality headset. Um, and so this, um, again, the pieces of the workflow that I articulated on the previous uh, graphic are, remain here as well, right? So there are just different pieces, whether you're looking at the design of the optics, whether you're looking at the design um, of, um, of uh, microstructures that are being used to guide light from the light source uh, to through those optics into the eye box, um, and then uh, being able to evaluate the full scene performance um, of the AR VR headset. So in this example, you know, what we're, we're highlighting is the design of an AR glasses that was um, in which light has been funneled from the light guide to the eye box using a diffractive waveguide, um, which is shown here on the top. Um, and so we're actually modeling the waveguide using the Lumerical tools. Um, and we're able to then model the actual pillar structure uh, inside of that wave, inside of that waveguide uh, with Lumerical. We're then able to use a dynamic uh, software link between Lumerical into ZMAX to be able to integrate the waveguide design directly uh, into the, the model uh, of the exit pupil expander that's used to funnel light from, again, from the light engine uh, directly into the eye box of the, of the headset. Uh, this is a dynamic link that actually then enables for a dynamic optimization of the waveguide structure um, to generate the best optical performance of the system. And so um, in this particular case, and um, I think there's a video showing here, but um, basically this video uh, is meant to demonstrate um, how the view of the, of the user's eye through the headset would be influenced uh, by the performance of this particular waveguide inside, uh, inside of this exit pupil expander, uh, bringing that uh, into, the full, into the full view of the system. Um, we can also support, um, as shown here on uh, kind of the bottom or, or towards the, the right, um, designs which use more micro, uh, freeform micro optics uh, uh, components rather than diffractive components uh, for providing that same level of functionality. So this is another use case that we're seeing where freeform uh, prisms are often being used uh, for better color performance, for, uh, for better optical imaging performance. Uh, so this decision of using diffractive waveguides versus freeform um, micro optics is still an open discussion um, in, in the AR community. And, and that's where I think simulation plays a critical role because with simulation, you can actually uh, evaluate these trade-offs and make the best design decisions uh, based on the, the performance that you're looking to achieve uh, within your system. And then finally, uh, just to demonstrate that, you know, in many cases with the, these AR devices, performance is not just about the performance that the user will see when they put the glasses or the headset on their face, but also how they're being viewed from the outside world. And so how will a user uh, that's um, wearing the, these glasses be able to interact with the world, you know, and being able to actually simulate, for example, here on the bottom right, um, what someone we'll see when they're, when they're looking at a user uh, that has put on a pair of AR sunglasses. So finally, I just wanted to, to close with this idea that simulation really is critical in advancing the design of these systems that are using freeform micro optics uh, to enable the next generation of consumer electronics devices. Um, you know, they provide confidence um, in, in the design, they help pro propel innovation uh, in, in the next generation of designs. Uh, they help uh, 
for users to reduce cost while increasing quality, increasing efficiency, because you can make a lot of uh, the appropriate design decisions in the software without having to go to physical prototyping um, ahead of time. You can basically make sure that you're, that the first product that is manufactured is actually going to do the job correctly. Um, and then as a result, they, they really, a simulation does enable a faster time to market. And so I just wanted to highlight by saying, you know, here at Ansys Optics, we feel like we have a complete and comprehensive simulation toolkit uh, for the design of these systems, um, which features best in class individual tools for simulating optical products that are being built today, as well as future products that we'll see in, in our next generation of devices, um, that we've built a seamless workflow between these tools that allow for a comprehensive, dynamic, multi-physics um, simulation of these tools that really allow for an end-to-end -end simulation um, of, the, of the design workflow. And although I didn't touch upon it here, um, you know, important part of simulation is really getting things done fast and out to market quickly. And so we have a, a strong and growing support for cloud and high performance computing platforms, which actually also enable customers uh, to, to have uh, accelerated designs. And so with that, I, I wanted to thank you for your attention. I know we're hitting the end of this workshop. It's been a long, a long afternoon, um, but thank you. Happy to take any questions as time permits, uh, but also, um, wanted to mention that we also will be at the Laser World Show next week. So do uh, please drop by our booth uh, in Hall B1 um, if you have the time and opportunity to do so. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. So yeah, we'll be pleased to, to meet you there uh, next week. Uh, any question, please, for Sanjay. So yeah, it was really interesting because we all know here that uh, how much simulation and design are, is important you know, for, for, this, for this technology. So. Thank you very much for the presentation, Sanjay. And by Absolutely. the way, we, we will Thank organize you, uh, Epic will organize a non-line technology meeting at the end of this year, focus on design and simulation as well. So I will be pleased to welcome you, Sanjay, uh, yes. for our presentation. It will be mainly on AOVR, but uh, or on design and simulation. So any question for, for Sanjay, please. Okay. So I guess that we running a little bit less. So I would like to, to thank all, all, uh, all of our speakers, um, of course. And uh, yeah, if we have any question, a question for about Fabulous, you have uh, yeah, Jessica, who is still here in the room. Uh, you have uh, her email address in the, in the chat. So you can also contact me, of course. Um, but yeah, we'd be pleased to, um, to answer you if you have any question regarding Fabulous. And uh, yeah, see you uh, for another uh, meeting, uh, fabulous workshop. So, Jessica, do you want do you want to to say a few words to end this meeting? Maybe. Well, uh, I mean, uh, so thank you everyone uh, for being fabulous and uh, for uh, being uh, a part of this meeting today. Uh, we will also be at Laser World of Photonics. Uh, so, uh, I think it was Entrance West Booth One Thousand uh together on the shared booth uh, with epic so if you have any questions also feel free to come by we will have some really cool demonstrators there as part of the first use cases in the project so be sure to uh, come by and uh, take a look thank you yeah, all so thank much you. thank you very much Jessica, for mentioning that we'll be at uh, laser world for but of course we'll be there so yeah see you see you next week if you if you are there thanks a lot thank you very much thank you all thank you all. bye Bye-bye. Thank you.